with another episode of the IT Business Podcast, the show for managed service providers and IT professionals. And on this show, we share product stories and tips and give you great conversations with peers and vendors to help you run your business better, smarter, and faster. Today, I was able to track down the hardest working man in the channel, Jay McBain, Chief Analyst at Canalis, joins me on today's show. Jay, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Working hard or hardly working? Well, if people were looking at your Facebook page and seeing all those pictures you've had up at the first part of January, eh, there might be some discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but you have earned that as you have uh, done quite a bit over the last year uh, and a lot more since you joined Canalis. And for those that do not know, Canalis is an independent uh, analysis company. And Jay is a leading channel and ecosystem industry analyst. And somewhere I saw, Jay, that you are now considered the world's leading expert in partner, channel, and ecosystem technology. Did you know that? Maybe I said that myself, and then it's just uh, (laughs) got legs. Uh, Well, listen, you are probably the well... hmm, you try to say this properly here because I'm not going to edit this. So, I mean, you are probably the most known, most respected analyst that we know in our side of the channel for managed service providers. You uh, communicate with a lot of the vendors in our channel. They all look to you uh, for the trends and what's happening in the channel. You always give a, a state of the channel address. So I think you're you're pretty well up there. And there's probably an easier way to explain it is unlike all of your listeners and and yourself, I don't really have a day job. My day job is to connect dots, you know, read volumes of news and information going on. Talk, like you said, to big, medium and small vendors, distributors, uh, managed service providers, system integrators, ISVs, kind of this entire network that we have of tens of millions of people and, and try to just pull out information where I can and then try to connect it back you know, to something that could be a trend, something that we should be watching. We could be in the early days of something and perhaps help others by connecting those dots that they don't just have the time to do because they're out actively working on your business or you're out actively helping customers. Uh, it's just a different role. Yep. Well, it has come in handy. Uh, when we last spoke, I believe it was last June, we ended up talking about distributors and the channel and how all that was going. We did talk about the growth of the channel. Now, this new term ecosystem, I think you were kind of going through that and researching and releasing stuff. We didn't talk about it. So can you quickly describe to us what you mean when you're talking about the ecosystem in the channel? Yeah, it's simply, um, if I were to just create a binary difference, there are partners that collect the customer's money, that car dealership, the retailer, the grocer, the pharmacy, 75% of world trade today goes indirectly. That, you know, channels is a word that's short for channels of distribution, which is your go-to-market, your routes to market. It's literally how you sell your product. And if you're in any industry today, you're usually and, and pretty much always selling through others. Um, that's, you know, over the case of the last 40 years in the tech industry, the tech industry last year was four and a half trillion dollars for the T, uh, in hardware, software services, 73.3% of it went through the channel. So obviously there's some really senior channel people that are trying to figure out the, the people and the processes and the programs and the technology to make all that work and make it better than their competition. Uh, what's come up recently though, is this whole non-transacting channel. And in the last five years, this is kind of one of those early moments that I'm watching is, what about all these technology alliances that are happening? You know, people coming together, the average software deal deal today has seven layers to it. So when Salesforce or ServiceNow or Workday or Marketo or somebody selling software, it has seven layers. When AWS, Microsoft, or Google sell their infrastructure, it has seven layers. When a security company today sells, it has seven layers. So how does all that work together, that alliances, the co-innovation, the value creation, and and what does that mean for partnerships? And then strategic and business alliances. But we also know that outside of the point of sale, that in those first, what we know is 28 moments before a customer makes a vendor selection, 
You could be buying a car or you could be buying services. It doesn't matter, software. In those 28 moments, partners are involved in you know, recording podcasts, in ebooks, in white papers, in events, in associations. They're in all those spheres of influence. And as your customers going through those early moments, there's you know 24 of the 28 moments are probably partners or prospects that should be partners that are driving that customer either, either towards you or against. And then now that everybody's going towards subscription and consumption models, the point of sale is only the first 30 days with the customer anyway. So you're not collecting that million dollar deal. It's probably you know 30K and now every 30 days forever. Who's doing the implementation, the integration? Who's doing the security, the compliance, the continuity? Who's doing the data, the automation, the managed services? So who's keeping that customer for life? The average customer today has seven partners and one or less of those seven collect their money for things. The other six partners are adding, you know, extremely strong value. And that's the ecosystem. You take your transacting partner, you take your set of non-transacting partners, add them all together. And that's who the customer trusts to take them to the next level. All right. So we're starting to understand that from the managed service provider perspective, I think for most of us, that came as the software as a service model, which is for us turning into now everything as a service. And we've talked about the last time we talked about that, you know, like you said, not just services, but we're moving into products and we're moving into, you know, whole industries that are now, you know, going as a service model. So the ecosystem, uh, SaaS is an ecosystem, B2B is an ecosystem, Um, I was reading somewhere people are considering something like, you know, Airbnb as an ecosystem. So it's not just tech. It seems as though everything has an ecosystem now. Um, It's every third party relationship that your company may have or all the places that you may work in is kind of this broader ecosystem. Some people like to visualize it as outer space and you've got different galaxies and you've got different solar systems and you've got all these things out there. And there's, you know, big suns like the sun we have. And that big sun might be a big vendor. It could be a Microsoft. It could be an AWS or an IBM or a Cisco or somebody. And then rotating around that, there's a lot of gravity that, you know, pulls in planets and, and different things. You've got comets shooting through. But you think about the vastness of space. And that's the ecosystem. And you're trying to figure out as a business, where can I take, you know, or, or position myself for the best opportunity the highest revenue profit opportunities in an industry that we're in that's doubling in size this decade and and figure out the places that I can, you know, grow my business the fastest, make the most money. What kind of buyers should I be in front of? 75% of software gets sold to people that are non-tech people. The head of marketing in many companies spend more money on tech than the head of tech. Mm -hmm. So in my position in front of the right buyer, am I in the right industries or sub industries? Am I, am I serving the right customer? who has money to, to do transformation? Am I in the right geographic coverage? Do I have the right product set? There's 250 categories of product. Am I in the places that are growing the fastest? I know we're going to talk about a few. Uh, am I in the right segment sector of the marketplace? SMB alone has six uh, sectors inside of it. And you can't compare a nine person flower shop to a 499 person shop that thinks they are like a fortune 500 company with a whole org chart and VPs of everything and everything else. So all these questions and then the service models that wrap around it. So, I mean, those are six questions that we should be asking. Am I in the right spot for my business? And as an entrepreneur, am I taking advantage to where the puck's going to be? Now, as you say that, I'm sitting here in my mind thinking, okay, you've got channel vendors that you talk to. You've got MSPs that you talk to. And those are two completely different markets that can deal with multitudes of ecosystems. Is there something that you can talk to us about that might be a leading indicator of what's to come? Now, I know you do a lot of stuff for specific vendors, so you have to be careful there. But yeah. but for our our part of the channel, uh, what do you see as as you know leading indicators of what to expect this year or later? Yeah, there's dozens of leading indicators. Like, I mean, you could talk about marketplaces. You know, when I talk about transactional channels, marketplaces as a place where money changes hands are growing at 86% compounded 
for as far as we can see. So it's gone from almost zero to 45 billion by 2025. So $45 billion is a big chunk of infrastructure that would have gone through the channel, but is now shifting and distribution is now shifting, you know, to a new way that money changes hands. But the companies that are running marketplaces, there's 20 major marketplaces that we, you know, kind of recognize with 80% of that activity, they're very partner friendly. And they're all publishing these multiplier numbers. For every dollar that goes through the marketplace, you know, at AWS, for example, there's $6.40 available for partners. Said another way is on a $100,000 AWS deal, you could make $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 if you have the right skills, the business practices, if you're charging the customer enough for enough things. Because in the old world of resale, there was only one place you made money from a vendor, which was at that point of sale. And whatever margin that was, was hopefully going to pay for the consulting design, architecture, implementation, integration, support, service. I mean, everything else we do for free. And those are changing as well. So vendors last year, you know, Microsoft in October bought out a point system that took a lot of money away from that point of sale and started paying partners before, during, and after the actual transaction. They took two thirds of the dollars and actually pay us post-transaction to keep that customer a customer for life. They pay partners for co-innovation and value creation and alliances. And there's just so many different ways to get recognized for the stuff we do every day. But we have to take an extra step, not only with Microsoft, but VMware did it, Okta did it, Smartsheet did it, a week or two back, IBM did it. So everybody's going to be kind of converting into these new programs. And we just got to make sure that we spend an extra minute making sure that we're getting recognized for all the great work we do at, at customers. So this is, you know, a lot of changes afoot in, in the industry. We're going through once in a generation shifts, not only in money, how money changes hands, but how partners participate in this, you know, industry that's doubling in size. So do we need to start looking at our vendors differently because of this marketplace idea? The first thing I can think of is distributors and products where Amazon to us was a marketplace where, you know, everybody can go to Amazon and get all the same stuff, and we need to look at that differently. You mentioned Microsoft and AWS. I know that we've got vendors in our space that are, you know, packaging these things for us. Do we need to look all at all of this differently based on this marketplace concept? Uh, we have to look at it as an opportunity. I mean, you could quickly go through what you just said and say, hey, this is going to be a risk. If the money's going to change hands differently and I don't get access to the front and back end margins that I did at the past. Right. Well, something also changed where marketplace fees, for example, Microsoft dropped them from 20% down to three. And you'd recognize marketplace fees because Apple's in court with Epic right now for charging, you know, 30, 35%. So governments in the EU and US are getting involved to, you know, bring these fees down. But Microsoft dropped it to three, Google dropped it to three. All the rest of the marketplaces are kind of settling in. And as a consumer, you know, 3% is about what the credit card swipe costs when you buy something. Yep. So the marketplace fees have dropped to pretty much what the cost of money is to, to kind of run the marketplace. It means, though, dropping from 20 to 3, it means that there's 17% available in what we would have seen as gross to nets, the front and back end margins to help partners. And on Microsoft, for example, brought out multi-partner offers. There's all kinds of plumbing inside these marketplaces now that we can participate and we can actually have Microsoft collect the money through enterprise credits and we get paid by Microsoft to do the services through the marketplace. So there's different models there that need to be understood. And if our customers, the psychology of our customer and our customers, by the way, in three years will be a majority millennial who grew up with the Amazon marketplace and feel comfortable walking across the street to AWS marketplace or a Salesforce or a ServiceNow or a Workday or a Red Hat or a SAP or Oracle, whatever they're buying, they feel comfortable in that digital environment, putting the seven things together. But as they're putting that together, they understand that there's six times the cost to actually get it to work. There's a huge opportunity for services. And if they can extinguish their enterprise credits and get it all done in one place, manage, monitor, measure it all in one place, it's a benefit to them. Kind of like we use Amazon today, you know, the boxes at our front door every day kind of solves all of our life's problems. It's a long tail of products. So 
there's a huge chance and there's partners being very successful with this change in, in how it's happening. And they're actually excited to get rid of the whole invoicing, chasing of money, breaking people's knees when they don't pay. You know, they're kind of excited to actually work on the high value stuff, high margin stuff and not be chasing nickels and dimes, you know, to pay their mortgage. Oh, and that makes sense. I think that at least from a managed service provider perspective, giving up some of that margin in those areas that, you know, we lose money a lot of times chasing that that yeah. dollar, like you say. So, yeah, focusing it in on other areas uh, would be great. Uh, let's do a quick shift because I know we don't have a lot of time, but there's been a ton of news, both when it comes to supply chain, cybersecurity spending is up. Uh, the latest report I saw, cybersecurity spending is up 13%. I don't know if that's a right number or not, uh, but I do know that the insurance companies are making our job easier by telling yeah. our customers that they have to get stuff and they have to come to us to get it. So that's nice. But what is the overall picture that we can we can gain from this? Yeah, in a recessionary time and with all the issues that we're facing around the globe uh, at a macroeconomic level, any opportunity that's double digits uh, is a good one. And one that we can profit from and multiply from is, is a good one. We watch the titans, titans in security. And it's an interesting market. It's unlike anything else in the world. You know, in cars, you know, there's three big auto manufacturers in, the, in North America. In, in most things, there's three big pharmaceutical companies. It's usually this world like, you know, General Electric, Jack Welch used to say, if you're not, you know, number one or two, you exit. Right. And that's just not the case anymore. You know, there's many SaaS categories that have 10 or 15 leaders in them that all do kind of slightly different things. But security is just a really weird market where we're following 4,300 security companies, vendors. We're following 2,000 of them that have channel programs. So it's a very noisy environment. We get right. a lot of voicemails. We get a lot of uh, emails every day, you know, trying to sell the latest mousetrap in security. But the strange thing about security is the number one vendor globally, Palo Alto, has less than 2% share. There's no outright leader in security, and there's still no company in security as a vendor that does end-to-end, -end, all the seven layers of security, right from the edge to the cloud and every layer of you know, email and authentication and everything up and down the levels. So the network, the data, um, et cetera, layers of security. So now you're, you're forced into this idea of working multi-vendor in security, and, and there's a broad set of you know vendors in every one of those categories and stuff. So we have a lot of work as MSPs to figure out what we take to market. And um, when we look at the titans like the Palo Altos, um, you've got you know the big crowd strikes and checkpoints, and Cisco is the third largest security company uh, in the world um, uh, due to 237 acquisitions in this space. Um, but if you look up and down the, the biggest companies, the Trend Micros of the world. Um, they're growing at 27.7% last quarter. So their growth is actually bigger than the overall industry growth. Wow. And so I want to be in those spaces. And there's some crazy things going on as well. Like a company like uh, ThreatLocker is up 600%. A company like Huntress is up 300%. So there are, there's some ridiculously fast growing categories within MSPs. And I'm not recommending any of those vendors other than to look. And you can do this on LinkedIn. Go look at how many people they have. Look at the growth. Look at how much money they're um, getting funded by Crunchbase, uh, private equity money. Like you can see out of the thousands of vendors who's on a big role. And if you double click underneath that, like what do they actually sell? Why is it, you know, um, being so successful in MSP land or in, you know, at the customer side? And is this, you know, a set of skills, business practices, maybe even if uh, m a strategy that I should be taking advantage of? as a leading indicator in this, you know, really robust, fast growing market. That is quite interesting that you mentioned 2000 vendors in the channel out of the other big number you said, when, when I thought that maybe there's 200 security vendors, but 2000 is a lot. And then to hear that Palo Alto is, you know, number one at 2%, that uh, is quite interesting. Less than two, yeah. Less than 2%. That is absolutely amazing. Now, a lot of these are companies that have kind of popped up in the last few years, right? I mean, we can't expect all of them to still be around, you know, two, five, ten years from now. 
Yeah, well, they have their own MA, and uh, you know, their mouse trap might be less of a mouse trap and more of just a feature that you know a bigger player could add over a weekend or, or acquire, you know, over the course of a weekend. Um, so this just the world economy of ninety four trillion dollars last year, and every industry inside of it, twenty seven industries, all work on this rule of three. Wow. And, and security just happens to be one of these categories that hasn't either matured uh, to that level or is just somehow um, an edge case when, when this idea of rolling up this, you know, major, major opportunity and having the big, you know, we talk about hyperscalers. There's three of them, AWS, Microsoft, and Google. You know, almost every category we think of, hardware. I used to sell, you know, with Lenovo. There's Dell, HP, and Lenovo. Almost every category what we sell, we usually have a choice of three of what we're going to lead with as, as MSPs. And in security, you know, you got to have a minimum of probably seven. And if you're fully working the stack, like if you're working your customer towards a zero trust or a SASE model, there might be 17 vendors to get them there. Hmm. A combination of hardware, training, and all of our detection and remediation tools. So, yeah. I- Software services, it runs the whole stack. Absolutely amazing. Well, Jay, I've, I've got an outline here that we are not going to get to everything because one of the things that I want to talk to you about, and it's more of a personal reason, is what we talked about at the top of the show. You went on this. I call it a world tour, although it's not. Uh, you and your family spent some time going down to the South Pole and then doing a nice little trip up. Tell me, what was that like? Yeah, so right before the pandemic, we did do a world tour. Uh, You know, I had a speech in Australia. We went as a family and dropped in 15 countries. We flew the wrong way around the world. And uh, we just dropped in 15 different countries. But we're at a point where we have, you know, a seven and eight year old that have been to, you know, 50 plus countries. Uh, We're at a point where, you know, let's go hit that seventh continent. You know, we've hit the seven wonders of the world. We've, you know, Michelle and I have hit, you know, pretty close to 100 countries now. But that seventh continent has been elusive because it's not easy to get to, to the South Pole. So eight years ago when she was pregnant, uh, we were going to go on this Russian frigate. It was like $10,000 a person. And, you know, you got to go to the South Pole, which was amazing. And nowadays uh, we decided not to go, which was lucky because uh, that frigate that year got caught in the ice. Mm. It was only 30 days of the year during Christmas and right till now that it's even reachable by ship because it freezes over. So um, uh, we we booked uh, when it became more consumer-like. Big cruise lines like Princess is what we went on, but others as Norwegian and others now have big ships that go and it's $2,000 a person. And like a cruise, you're eating steak and lobster every day and, you know, in the hot tub and stuff. So you're not on a frigate, you're not on some exploration, you know, vessel. Um, So you got to get the best of both worlds. So it's now becoming more of a consumer friendly place to go with kids and you're not afraid of, you know, um, getting stuck in the ice or other things. So it was just a once in a lifetime thing. And it got delayed for three years because of COVID. Mm. We finally got to do it this Christmas. Nice. Nice. Now, the reason I wanted to ask you about this is tomorrow I will be heading out on a cruise. And it's the, it's the first cruise that is more than the four hour go out to international waters, gamble and come back. <laughs> so we're headed out on Royal Caribbean and we'll be, over at uh, Coco Cay and Nassau, Bahamas, and it is four days, which is a long time for me. And the wife is packing as though it's four weeks. Of course. So how long was your trip? Because it looked like you guys were on a boat for quite a long time. Yeah, the trip itself was 21 days because okay. we wanted to spend some time in, in Chile, Santiago. We wanted to spend time in Buenos Aires on the way back. So we spent like three or four days on either side of it. But we were on the ship for 16 days. And unlike the tour that you're going on, which every day will be at a new island, new beach, uh, most of those days were sea days to go from South America to the South Pole. So every day we woke up, you know, as a as a sea day, which you had to look at the agenda and look at the bingo and look at the trivia and look at the you know different bands that are playing. And you had to fill your day with stuff. Right. Like it was like an old age home where you're trying to you know keep busy. <laughs> um, but you're going on a cruise. We're going on a Royal Caribbean cruise in June to Alaska. Okay. Now that we live in Florida, we're just going to icy cold. I was going to say, what is, what is say, but, why are you leaving to go to cold places? <laughs> but uh, I've been to 48 of the 50 states. That makes 49. So that's one of the reasons. 
All right. Uh, so I got to make my way to New Mexico somehow uh, to make it 50. But, you know, the idea of a cruise is um, you're going to have opportunities probably for all four days to get off and enjoy a beach and stuff like that. At night, when you get on, you're going to eat steak and lobster and hopefully you can stay up and watch the band. Uh, it's going to be a nice, the Caribbean's nice and smooth. So it's going to be a nice little rumble. You don't need Dramamine and things like that. And I think before you know it, the vacation is going to be over. Um, talk about packing. We had a pack for Christmas for two young kids. Oh, my. We right. had a pack for, um, we had to help Santa. And then we had a pack for her birthday, which was four days after Christmas. We ended up bringing, I think, like six 50 pound bags full of stuff to get ready for these major holidays. And to celebrate almost like you would at home. So that added a layer of complexity. Oh, my. That uh, that sounds excruciating. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't have, like, down when you're down in those places, you don't have Uber XL. You can't just order, like, a van or a, a Suburban. You know, they come rolling up in a little uh, car, like a little Fiat 500 or a little Mini or something. That's what they're calling Uber XL. And so now you're sitting here with six massive bags and four people. Wow. Going like, am I going to send my bag separately? And like, how are we going to manage all this logistically? And it, it became a fun trip on that behalf. Wow. Well, I do want to say it looked like you guys had fun and happy for you. Again, I mentioned you are one of the hardest working people in our industry. So uh, you de- you guys deserve some time away. All right. And, well, thank you for uh, having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. And we'll catch up with you again soon. Folks, ladies and gentlemen, Jay McBain. Senior Analyst at Canalis, thank you for the time. Thank you.